know me. I'm, I'm Eric Grimson. I have the privilege of serving as MIT's chancellor. You can ask me during the break what a chancellor does. Um, I'm also the current chair of the board of directors of the CRA, and it is my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Tom Davis. He's currently a director in Deloitte's Federal Government Services Group, where he advises clients on major trends, opportunities, and challenges facing the federal government, with a focus on technology innovation and government transformation. Through 31 years of public service, Mr. Davis has been at the forefront of creative improvement to government operations, including serving for many, many years in Congress. He was a leader in promoting the President's management agenda and maximizing the performance of government agencies. He also served as the co-chair of the Information Technology Working Group, which promotes a better understanding among members of Congress on important issues in the computer and technology fields and industries, something very important to us. Uh, after the 2002 election, he was named chairman of the House Committee on Government Reform, where you may remember he gained national prominence uh, for uh, chairing the hearings on the use of performance enhancing substances in professional sports. And among many other achievements, um, he has, uh, is well known for his report on the federal response to Hurricane Katrina, his sponsorship of legislation giving the FDA authority to regulate tobacco, and one that I particularly appreciate the passage of the National Capital Transportation Amendments Act, which means that the Metro will be very good at getting me back out to the airport later tonight, like the rest of you. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Tom Davis. Thank you very much. Well, you've heard from all the scientists. I was a political science major at Amherst, so I'm going to give you a little different perspective. I was an IT executive before I came to Congress, and then I was a county executive out in Fairfax uh, before I came. Um, the thing I'm proudest about, though, in my resume is that I retired from Congress uh, after seven terms undefeated and unindicted. And I think um, <laughs> we were always a little jealous in Fairfax. We thought we had a pretty good IT group. Uh, but when I went out as a freshman in, in, in Congress, I went up to the Silicon Valley to see why they thought they were so hot, because our unemployment rate in Fairfax is lower. Uh, actually, I think we're a wealthier county than uh, Santa Clara. Uh, and I had lunch with Dr. Bert Richter, who was the head of the Stanford University Laboratories, and he set me straight in terms of why the Silicon Valley was, uh, uh, was what it was. A lot of federal funding out there with the government uh, labs at Livermore, Sandia, Berkeley, Stanford. Uh, but he told me an interesting story about one of his colleagues at Stanford who won the Nobel Prize and found out, and Dr. Richter was a Nobel Prize winner. But he, he talked about how this Nobel Prize winner uh, after he won it, found out he could make more money going around the country giving speeches and lectures than he could teaching or writing. So he started going to speaking to him. And he could get $10,000, $25,000 per speech, and he was in such demand that some days he could give two or even three speeches. And the money just starts pouring in. Well, this guy had been in the academy all his life. He never really thought about money. Uh, there are only so many liberal causes he could give it away to. So he figured, you know what? He said, I'm going to travel in style. So he bought one of these fancy high-tech limousines. It had the, the, the global positioning system. It had all the digital stuff, a wet bar, uh, all the accoutrements you need to travel in style. The chauffeur would pick him up in the morning, drop him off at speech. He'd give a speech, collect his check, hop in the limousine, go on to the next town. And this was repeated day after day until one day they're between towns. And the chauffeur says, Professor, he said, this isn't fair. He said, what do you mean? He said, you know, he said, you make more money sometimes in one day than I make in an entire year. And yet I have to drive you through rain, snow, sleet, icy roads, heavy traffic. I've never gotten you there one minute late. He said, but the worst thing is, he said, I've had to listen to every one of your speeches. <laughs> in fact, he said, I've heard your speech so many times. He says, I can give it better than you can. Well, this kind of challenged the professor. He said, all right, hotshot. He said, you think it's so easy? He said, in this next town, he said, all they have is my curricula vitae. They don't know what I look like. We're about the same age. Why don't we change uniforms? I'll drive you in. You give the speech. He said, if you pull it off, I'll split the fee with you. He said, if you screw it up, I'm going to have to give the money back and explain what happened, so don't embarrass me. So go into the town. Sure enough, the Nobel laureate opens the door. The uh, chauffeur walks in. He's uh, ushered into the green room. He does some chit-chat with the uh, uh, folks who are putting the event on. Uh, he walks into this vast auditorium. They have sold out. People have paid top dollar to hear this Nobel laureate talk about how he won the Nobel Prize and talk about his learned treatises. He gets this introduction about how he won the Nobel Prize. He proceeds to the microphone, and sure enough, he has memorized the speech, and he gives it perfectly, flawlessly, except for one thing. Since he has memorized the speech, his cadence is a little faster than the professor's, and he finishes up about 10 minutes earlier than planned. 
Well, the Master of Ceremonies comes out after a thunderous ovation, uh, hands him his check, looks at his watch. He said, ladies and gentlemen, he said, this is entirely unexpected. He said, but I see we have time for questions from the audience. First question. Uh, professor, I noticed in one of your earlier treatises you discussed the effects of photosynthesis, sunspots, and their effects on avic migration in southern New Zealand. He said, recent scientific periodical publications completely debunked this theory. I wonder if you could explain to us in some detail this dichotomy. Scratching his head. Finally, he looked straight at the question. He said, You know what? He said, You ought to be embarrassed asking such a dumb, stupid question like that <laughs> in this room full of learned people. He said, That question's so easy. He said, It is so elementary. He said, I'm going to let my chauffeur in the back of the room answer it. So, <laughs> so what I want to do today, give a little bit, uh, if I can, an overview on politics and technology and how they uh, interact. Uh, as chairman of the government committee, I worked on a lot of this legislation. Uh, working behind the scenes. The good news on the IT function of the science is it really, it really crosses party lines. Uh, there's not an ideological way to do IT. At least they haven't found it yet. I'm sure they're working on it. Uh, but the problem is, though, given the political agendas of the parties, it's also not a really high priority. Uh, that's why we're where we are. The government, you know, today, for every dollar the government spends, they're borrowing over 40 cents. Um, we have got ourselves into where basically what government's doing with the 10,000 baby boomers are retiring a day, debt now 100 percent of GDP. Uh, we're in a situation where most of what government does is redistribute money from one group to another. And that means uh, when you add up pensions, uh, veterans, debt service, the entitlement programs, uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, it's almost two-thirds of federal spending is in just those areas. Basically, I so those are investments in the past. It's the General Motors model, where the first $2,500 of a General Motors car went to spend uh, health care for retired employees. That's where the bulk of our spending goes today in government, which means we're not investing in the future. So it's not a question of whether we're spending too much or too little. It's a question, are we spending enough in these areas? The, the nice thing about Niter D is we've really gotten our money's worth exponentially. It's been very efficient. It's one of the best examples of agencies being able to work and coordinate uh, together and try to take uh, a, a few dollars and leverage them in an appropriate, uh, in an appropriate way. Um, but at the same time, if you're spending two-thirds of your money on the past, that means you're not investing in the future. That means we're not investing in education, in R&D, in infrastructure, in the kinds of things that are take America to that uh, next uh, stage of competitiveness in a global economy. And the political class often views technology as some kind of a quick fix, but not as part of a long-term strategy. I used to say to a House member, the long term is two years. Uh, to an administration, the long term is four years. You want to time everything so that when your reelect is up. and so. To be able to get uh, programs together like NIDR D and some of the uh, computing acts and, uh, the, and, and some of the uh, subjects of today is uh, in itself an accomplishment because these are long-term goals and Congress usually think in terms of short-term sequences or reacting to something that is, uh, that is happening on the ground. Now we know this has got to change. We have some pressures right now that Congress is feeling and the government's feeling that are going to force changes that I think are, are helpful to us actually. Um, Government's going to have to, they're going to get pressure to do more with less. That means more investment in IT, not less. There is a problem with that because under budget scoring rules, generally investments in IT don't score well. They don't look at the long-term savings. They just look at the short-term costs. But as we start giving agencies more discretion to do more with less, we're starting to see them come up with their own investments and in innovations. Under the old system, it was just spend whatever money you could get. So we're starting to see those innovations uh, uh, now under very, very tight uh, budgets. Um, we know both parties can play a key role in this. Uh, it's not part of the presidential debates. I don't know how many of you follow the Republican presidential nominee. I'm a Republican. I follow, it's, like a, it's like a reality TV show to watch this on there. And any, if you talk about technology, you're man the moon, and you get laughed. It's not like the big issues. But at the end of the day, um, both parties can play a role in this. Uh, NIDR-D, uh, the American Competes Act, the Next Generation Internet Research Act, were all done on a bipartisan basis. Members of both parties figuring, look, we didn't get everything we wanted, uh, but we got a lot and we got things started and we at least set a road map out to where we need to go in the future. And I think these initiatives have helped pave the way for uh, biomedical breakthroughs, you know, the Watson, advanced analytics, and many of the subjects uh, that you're talking about in today's uh, forum. 
Uh, yet with the growing uh, pressures on the body politic to cut taxes on the Republican side or to expand entitlements on the Democratic side, you sometimes worry that today's leaders may l legislate on their for short-term political pressures rather than take the long-term view uh, and invest more in the knowledge sector, where I think we need to go. And their inability to get together on simple things like energy independence should not be a tough issue. Uh, the uh, immigration, just not facing that, he's just kicking it down the road, and of course the long-term debt. But in this environment, again, I'm optimistic because uh, as we ask governments to do more with less, they have nowhere else to turn but to the information technology and what you can uh, offer in, into these fields. IT can literally uh, bridge the gaps in creating efficiencies uh, among and between agencies. Uh, health IT can literally save lives and at the same time save money. High performance computing can open new windows to knowledge and exploration to areas we wouldn't have even dreamed about. We've seen with the internet it's grown to something nobody dreamed about at the beginning of. Um, cyber security innovations can be the gateway uh, to preventing and not just only a cyber Pearl Harbor, but in protecting state secrets and, and, and intellectual property. I don't think we'll see anything significant in the next uh, six months. It's an election year. Uh, you hear a lot of talking heads. Uh, but at the same time, the work that you're doing, uh, the products you're producing, forums like this, I think are very, very helpful in laying the groundwork uh, for that next, uh, for the next four years after we get the election behind us, because these problems don't go away. They keep mounting, and they're going to have to be uh, addressed. Um, interest groups and super PACs uh, are in spending overdrive. Uh, we have a 24-7 news model right now. We have a Fox model and an MSNBC model. Uh, these generally don't uh, help uh, uh, very much in terms of uh, a uh, thoughtful discussion uh, on the issues. Uh, but your works and your deeds and your innovations mean a lot, uh, and they are really making a difference, and, and people do notice. You may not think so in this environment, but uh, it is making a difference. And that's why what you're doing here is so important, uh, informing uh, the public, informing the political class uh, and their leadership about what you've accomplished over the last 20 years uh, and more in the visions of uh, what we see ahead. Uh, you're building the foundations to our future. I think I'm very confident that future Congress's administrations are going to eventually get it right, right-size our investments uh, into information technology and its attendant appendages and the possibilities that it brings to everybody. Uh, the interaction of the NIDR D uh, agencies, again, is one of government's best examples of interagency coordination. It's proven exponentially um, valuable in the advancement of technology. I just want to thank everybody for what you've done. And, I'm the only one that stands behind between you and the break. So they gave me 15 minutes, and thank you.